Very welcome. Uh, I'm really happy. I'm here with Brad Smith. Brad is the president of uh, Microsoft. And Microsoft is the second biggest holding in the fund. Uh, and each Norwegian own roughly 40,000 kroner worth. So it's pretty amazing. And um, I also have Ulf Sverdrup here. He's a director of NUPI, the Norwegian Institute of Foreign Affairs. And uh, today we are actually going to talk about artificial intelligence. So really pleased to have you here. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure. It's a privilege for me to be here with you and to say thank you to everyone in Norway who owns a piece of Microsoft. Now, Mark Andreessen recently wrote that we should not regulate AI. We should stuff it into everything we have in order to beat the Chinese. And that was under the headline, we win, they lose. Now, why is that not the correct thing to do? Or is it? Well, I would say, I think it's good to put AI to use. It's good to put AI to good use. And it's good to have guardrails that in effect will keep AI on the road and keep it under human control. The opportunity to use it for good is enormous to improve health care, to find new cures for cancer, to develop new drugs, to improve education for every student, to improve productivity. So I think the potential is enormous. But as we've said in the past, every tool can become a weapon. Almost every tool is unfortunately turned by somebody into a weapon. It will take not just responsible companies, but law and regulation to manage this properly. Mm. But but how can one regulate something which is integrated and ingrained into weapons, medicine, you know, autonomous driving, um, just everything we do. How can you regulate one single piece of it? I think you're hitting on an important point, which is that AI is not one thing, it's some different things. And we should recognize that as we build a regulatory architecture that matches the technology of architecture of AI itself. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that if, say, you're a bank and you have an application that's using AI, it will be your responsibility to ensure that you still comply with all the banking laws and people in the bank will need to be trained. The banking regulators will be trained in order to ensure that. You know, we'll look at these new models like GPT-4 from OpenAI. That's where we at Microsoft have, in part, deployed the technology so OpenAI could train that. And let's just say there'll be certain safety standards. Um, I think that there'll be s- safety practices and processes that need to be followed when models are built. There will need to be some kind of safety certification before the model is, say, released. It may even need to be licensed. Mm. And the data centers where AI is deployed will need to be protected from, say, a physical and cybersecurity perspective. Those are just three examples. What it means is you break this down into pieces and you focus on each piece in a much more pragmatic way. Mm. But you're a commercial company. You are listed. You have shareholders like us. Uh, You want to make as much money as possible, right? So why do you want to kind of self-regulate? Well, I think we frankly both want to self-regulate and we do support a degree of government regulation because ultimately companies do well in the long term when people have confidence in what they're buying and using. And if you lose the public's confidence, you fundamentally, I think, put your investment and the interest of your investors at risk. Our goal is to provide a return for the investors here in Norway, not just for the next week or month or quarter, but for years into the future. So as we like to like to say, we need to manage for the decade and the quarter simultaneously. And the best way to do that is to be responsible. And I just don't think there's any substitute for that. Mm. So one of the big challenges, I think, is that companies, of course, have to be conscious of their responsibility and impose self-imposed regulation and restrictions. At the same time, they need to be compensated with government regulatory measures. Um, And those government regulatory measures cannot be only in one jurisdiction. You have to be international. So how do you see that moving forward? I think this is a hugely important part of the challenge. I would actually step back and say, look at two things. First, wherever one goes in the world today, I find people in government or in the public are saying, let's not repeat the mistakes we made with social media. And yeah, I think it's fair to ask, what were those mistakes? And I think to some degree, we all became a little too euphoric 
in the wake of the Arab Spring a decade ago, everyone said social media is going to be the savior of democracy. And then within four or five years, it had been weaponized and turned against democracy itself. So let's start by being clear eyed and having a common conversation and understanding on an international basis about what can go wrong. What are the problems we need to solve? I think in part, it's about making sure that AI is used safely under human control, you know, that we protect security and the like, and you know, we have a, a, a short but common and critical list of problems. And then second, let's devise specific solutions, which still have not really come into being with respect to social media, and let's pursue them on a coordinated international basis. This will not be easy, but if we're going to make the most of the AI moment, I think it's an essential step we need to find a way to take. But how did this need for coordination drive with your view of how the world is looking these days, where we have more geopolitical rivalry, more competition, uh, frankly, say very little attention and interest in cooperation? I think one can always get up in the morning and look at the world's problems and either focus on what we cannot get done or what we can get done and how we might do that. And for me, that starts in part by looking at what I'll call the like-minded countries. Where are there countries that have shared values? Fundamentally, in large part, we're talking about the world's democracies. Where do they have shared interests? And let's build shared norms. And there will be countries that will not want to join. There will be countries that will even resist and oppose this. But let's start by building a common foundation. And when we have that foundation in place, we also have a greater capacity to then talk with other parts of the world that may look at this differently. And and what could what could such a body look like? I mean, who would be involved at what level? What would it uh, look like? In the world today, there are a few different groups that can come together and really act on an international basis. Certainly in Europe, people naturally look to the European Union, and that's a critical part of this. But I think in these issues, people are increasingly looking at, say, the G7, the G7 plus, say, India and Indonesia. The European Union and the U.S. have said together they want to pursue a voluntary code for AI with that group of countries. We see things move sort of to the G20, but it's really the G20 minus China and Russia, so it's sort of the G18. But you see different things come together. I think there's another dimension, though, that is very important. What we're fundamentally talking about is multilateral diplomacy and action. In the 21st century, I think multilateral action usually requires and involves multi-stakeholder coalitions. And they typically focus on doing one or two things well. So the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace was really invented, as the name suggests, in Paris under President Macron's leadership in 2018. Microsoft participated in that. Um, the Christchurch call was really led by Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern with the help of tech companies, including our own, in the wake of the Christchurch massacre. And fundamentally, what people have done is said, let's bring like-minded governments and companies and civil society together. Let's protect elections. That's part of the Paris call. Let's ensure that terrorists don't engage in mass shootings the way they did in Christchurch, New Zealand, and stream it over the internet. And I think if we focus, narrow a bit the problem we want to solve, take it one at a time, and build these kinds of coalitions one can actually move a lot faster, and that's a good thing. Mm. Ulf, what do you think about what we are seeing out of uh, the EU so far in terms of the AI Act? Yeah, so the EU, European Union, is is a big market, and they have regulatory ambitions, and they also have geopolitical ambitions. So they don't want to just copy laws and regulations or policies coming out of the US. So the EU is about to establish its own AI Act, it's passed in the parliament, or but still uh, some time to work, you know, some work to be done in order to complete it, but they plan to put it into place in by 2026. And I think they have a fairly sound approach to it with the risk assessment, something that they consider 
uh, prohibited, something that they consider high risk, and then they introduce some thresholds for for activities there, and particularly related to transparency, sandboxes, etc. But the fundamental question is, of course, can Europe regulate this alone? Mm. Uh, how can they cooperate with the US in the regulatory space? And uh, perhaps also the competitiveness agenda. Mm. Will European businesses be able to compete under the European framework or will they move elsewhere? Mm. So, so, so there are so of difficulties in regulating. So Brad, how much mess can we make in Europe? How many rules and how much regulations can we make uh, before the Americans just think, you know, let's not, let's not go there, let's not be bothered? The good news for the European Union is that the market is so large that it's difficult for any company, in my view, to aspire to global importance without being present in Europe. Um, and so that is a strength. Like all strengths, one can put it at risk if one goes too far in a different area. I would generally agree, though, that you know the AI Act has been progressing in a thoughtful way. Um, I was certainly one person among many who saw the first draft and said, oh my goodness, this is going to regulate Europe out of AI use and that would be bad for Europe and the competitiveness of European industry and commerce. But I think, as is often the case in any sound legislative process, people use time to educate themselves, to get smarter, to compare views. And you know, there's still more of that work ahead. The parliament and the council and the commission will come together. And uh, I'm optimistic that the European Union will end up with what I'll call a forward-leaning, innovative, but balanced and appropriate framework. And if it does that, I think it will find it much easier to then coordinate with, say, the United States, with Canada, with Japan. Um, it takes us back to the G7 The G7 actually is a good group because it does bring together enough countries outside Europe. And then when you add, say, India and Indonesia, even more so, that it sort of helps, I think, countries find more common ground on a global basis. Mm. Now, where are we in the AI race? If we start to look at the US versus China, I mean, I appreciate we have different uh, kind of areas of AI, but um, just uh, how does the competitive landscape look? I would put it into two categories. The fir first is the development of AI. And I think the U.S. is leading when it comes to the development of large scale, say large language models like GPT-4. Uh, and you have every day this partnership with OpenAI and Microsoft competing with, say, Google and its acquisition of DeepMind. And, you know, there, and then you have a company like Anthropic, you know, three different groupings really advancing what you would think of as frontier models for AI, which, as the name suggests, are AI models at the frontier of technology. We're months, not years, ahead of China in this race. And in other areas, I think China is actually ahead. Narrow, special purpose AI uses like vision, where they just have so much data that they collect and AI they develop based on identifying people's faces and you know, computing algorithms on top of that. That's the race to develop AI. I think increasingly what we'll also see is the race to deploy it. One should never underestimate for a moment how quickly China moves as an economy in deploying new technology. And I think when you get into that context, you have China, you have Asia, where people are embracing it very quickly. You have North America, and then you have Europe. And I think part of the conversation in Europe hopefully will focus on both of these dimensions. It's not just about building it. It's about getting the benefits from it. So you mentioned um, language models. You mentioned facial recognition. What are the other uh, kind of verticals which you are monitoring? Well, you certainly see um, specific silos, if you will, in different areas. You know, vision is one. You know, you you definitely see a, a vertical uh, around, call it biometric data, around genomic data, uh, you, you know, work that very much turns on getting access to a large sample of you know, human data. And you know, there you see a country like the like China you know, in a strong position. You actually see a country like the United Arab Emirates in a very strong. 
uh, leadership position. Basically, what I would say more broadly is if you think about something like ChatGPT or GPT-4 and say, you know, that can do a thousand things well, well, somebody can try to build a thousand different models that each does one thing well. Obviously, no one's going to build all of those, but it's not as computationally intensive. It's not as expensive. It's probably possible to go faster. And so to some degree, there will be a race between different technology models in terms of how much each model is designed to do. When you talk about this geopolitical rivalry in China, do you think that in the future Microsoft will be a company that will serve the G18 or G7 or plus plus rather than a global company? What is interesting about Microsoft today is we are a global company, but we don't play the same role in every country. Um, one of the things I'm always interested in each year is the Economist publication from the Economist Intelligence Unit, where it lists the countries of the world and it ranks who's a democracy and who's not. And roughly 95% of Microsoft's revenue comes from the democracies of the world, and 5% comes from the other half. And you know what that reflects, I think, is the broader, and I'll even say more special role that we play in the world's democracies, say in Europe, in NATO. We fundamentally are the providers of the digital infrastructure on which the economies grow. And we play a role in promoting and protecting and even defending the democracies of the world. And you see that in a very pronounced, even dramatic way in Ukraine today. That doesn't mean we play no role in other places. But it is a more limited role. We're present in China today, even though it's only about one and a half percent of Microsoft's revenue. And in part, we're there to serve multinational companies so that they can use our technology in China the same way they do in other places. In part, we're there, in my view, to advance common global goals, like the reduction of carbon emissions and using technology to improve the sustainability of the planet. Yeah, and there are certain things that we avoid doing. Um, we protect against what we would regard as human rights abuses so that our technology is not used for that purpose. For obvious reasons, we don't provide sensitive technologies broadly, and we have special controls in place, for example, so that the Chinese military is not using it. Um, and so what one recognizes, and I think, is fundamentally, rather than a world where we're present or absent in a binary way, we're present in a very ubiquitous way in part of the world, we're present in a more limited way in other places. And then you get to a country like Russia where we're basically not present at all. Um, so the world is complicated and we have to manage that complexity. And and what kind of expectations do you think we as large shareholders should have to the companies when it comes to their use of AI? I think that fundamentally, what I hope our investors will look for in a company like Microsoft is what I shared, for example, with our own employees, the 758 employees we have in Norway. I think our goal is to become and remain the most trusted company for what has become the most important technology in the world. The key is to innovate so that we're always at the frontier of technology, but to do it in a way that sustains people's trust. First and foremost, the trust of our customers, so they know they are using a product that can be deployed safely and security, securely and the like. But fundamentally, I just think in some ways, a tech company is not entirely different from a bank. First of all, in the world today, if you want to get something done that's truly important, there's probably two things you need. The first is money, and the second is technology. But second, like a bank, we need to be an institution that people trust, not just for tomorrow, but for years and decades into the future. When we look at um, AI and how companies use it, what are the type of things we should be looking at? I think along the lines of transparency and so on, but what are the, what are the factors that you would split it into? Well, the very first thing I would look at if I'm a company is, 
is this technology going to make me better as a business or a government, for example, or an NGO? So I would start with that. And you know, fundamentally, what I would say in that context is our vision is encapsulated in the word that we apply. We call this a co-pilot. It is not designed to replace the human need to think. It is designed to help people think better, faster, more efficiently, and to advance productivity. In the central line of business of a company and in every supporting function, sales, marketing, advertising, finance, legal, human resources. And I think it's up to us to show that you can drive a better business with this technology than without it. Your people will be more productive. What we're finding is that people who use this to write software code are not only more productive, they're actually happier employees because it eliminates a lot of drudgery. That's the mm, first thing. Mm. But second, I think one does need to look at the risks it can create and have confidence that first we've put in place the practices to manage those, to measure them, to mi mitigate or reduce them, to address, say, privacy risks or security risks. Um, and then we share that so that when you deploy it, you're able to do so with confidence. I think the word transparency is a critical one, as you uh, referred to it. One of the challenges with this technology is, in truth, we're still getting better at figuring out how to make it explainable to people. I often have people come up to me and say, why did ChatGPT give me that answer? And I do think you're going to see ongoing advances in you know, what is really referred to as the explainability of AI, and I think you're right to use the word auditing. You know, we will see the development of standards for what we think of as responsible AI, all of these factors that people are concerned about. And then once the standards are created, you'll see auditing against that, both internally inside a company like Microsoft, but you'll see third-party audits, even government audits, I suspect, emerge in a short number of years. So, Brand, you said that Microsoft is working to to support democracies also. But at the same time, some critics of AI would say that AI has the potential to undermine democracy, spreading fake news, breaching copyright rules, etc. So what would be your response to that to those that kind of criticism? It's really twofold. First, I think we should be clear-eyed. We should recognize that People say, especially foreign governments, take the Russian government, which operates a global, at-scale network to generate information designed to mislead the public, and it puts it out in 23 languages. We, we monitor that. And for, for better, or really in this case, for worse, unfortunately, we should assume that bad actors will use AI to do what they do more effectively, to generate content more quickly at less cost. They'll likely use it to try to target the dissemination of, call it disinformation, in that kind of way. That's the bad news. I would say, though, I believe there's good news that is going to outweigh the bad news because we have the ability to harness the power of AI to better defend against these threats. That, to me, is the fundamental lesson of the war in Ukraine, where defense has proven to be stronger than offense. And I am optimistic about the power of AI from a defensive perspective, in part because we have so much data. Second, we have the world's best experts to figure out how to harness the power of that data. And those experts can now use AI as a game changer. Because the biggest challenge in having so much data is the ability to sift through it and detect patterns and then develop defenses once you identify the threats. AI is a game changer for helping smart human beings make use of more data. So I'm optimistic, and I would say more than that, I'm determined. I think we at Microsoft are determined. It's really an imperative for us. We have to use the power of AI to improve the defenses of democracy better and faster than the adversaries of democracy might use to turn this into a weapon against it. In your, in your book, uh, Tools and Weapons, you talk about how uh, these things can influence uh, elections. Do you think it will influence the next presidential election in the US? I think we should assume that there are foreign adversaries that will seek 
to use digital technology, including AI, to try to impact the next presidential election in the United States, potentially the next parliamentary election in the United Kingdom, potentially the whole round and range of parliamentary elections for, say, the European Parliament. We have to be prepared. The most naive thing we could do, I think, is assume that everything will go fine and we don't need to have better defenses. So we're focused in 2023 on how we strengthen those defenses for 2024, how we work with candidates and campaigns and political parties and democratic institutions, and how we might find some new collaborative efforts that would bring together, say, governments and civil society and tech companies to defend against some of the new threats, say the use of AI to create deep fakes. And so there's a lot of work that's starting now. It has to go quickly. I think from my perspective, we have a deadline. It's called the 1st of January, 2024. We have to have the strong and in some cases better defenses in place to address these risks. And to which extent does um, AI make cyber even more of a threat? Well, I think AI can be used to try to develop more potent, call it cyber weapons. It can be used to better target the delivery of those cyber weapons against specific victims. But here again, I am very optimistic that it will strengthen defenses faster than offenses. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, because what we've seen, say, over the last five or six years, is two really important advances in cybersecurity defensive technology. The first is threat detection. You have to detect an incoming attack. And the second is the ability to defend against it, which is fundamentally based on the ability to detect it, code, if you will, a virus to protect a, a device against it. And today, in a way that was not the case five or six years ago, if you work for a government or a company, in all probability, you have to enroll your device, your laptop, your phone, so that it is the beneficiary of what we call endpoint protection. Fundamentally, what this means is when we at Microsoft identify a new cybersecurity attack, we detect the threat, we are able to code the virus or protection, say the, the vaccine to stop it, and then we're able to distribute that code, that vaccine to every device around the world in somewhere between minutes to a couple of hours. And if we can now use AI to detect threats faster, to create the code to vaccinate devices faster, I think we can stay ahead of these offensive attacks. And that really needs to be our goal. How would you see the role of the company? So in this, um, this world, technology companies are getting really big. Microsoft, your market cap is bigger than the GDP of Korea. So how do you see your role in shaping politics in, as a global actor yourself in this new geopolitics? It's a question that people often ask about, and I believe in a world where no one is above the law. And that means no person's above the law, no government's above, above the law, no company, no tech company, no product is above the law. So what that fundamentally means is you need law. And then as a company, you have to respect and abide by the law of each country in which you operate. That, I think, is a first principle that fundamentally has served humanity extraordinarily well, going back to, I'll say, the times of ancient Greece or even earlier. The real challenge is, how do you make this work in a world where technology is global and moving so quickly and governments are confined by territory? And I think what it means is that we have a huge responsibility, first, to provide information so governments know where the technology is going. Second, to collaborate, especially in areas like the protection of cybersecurity, especially in an era where you have a shooting war, a real physical war in a country like Ukraine. I think it means that we all have to find new ways to collaborate across borders. If every country goes it alone, if every government tries to operate with complete independence and with disregard for the needs of others. If in a worst case situation, governments try to regulate technology beyond their own borders and start bumping into each other, we risk creating not just a cacophony, but an 
incredible confusion. So we're going to need to innovate. We need our governments to innovate. And it does take us back to the need for multilateral and multi-stakeholder diplomacy. And it changes the nature of a company like Microsoft in terms of how we need to engage. I always think from a starting point of humility, let's start by recognizing everything we're not and everything we don't know. But let's do what we can to share information and contribute to real solutions. Uh, Brad, you talk about standards against which we can audit. What type of standards are we talking about? I think we will need a new age and era for AI safety standards. You know, fundamentally that focus on the risks of what can go wrong with AI and protect against them. And the good news is we're seeing some of this emerge already, whether it's in the context of voluntary international standards or in the United States, there's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. They've created an AI risk management framework that I think has a lot of promise. And it builds on a decade and more of work by NIST in the cybersecurity space. So companies, broadly speaking, are familiar with it, not only in the United States, but, but more broadly. So let's let the standards organizations develop the standards. Let's encourage them to do it in what I would call a non-political way, grounded in a lot of interaction with the people who create technology, but fundamentally as their own decision makers. Once we have those standards, let's encourage companies to implement them. One of the things we've encouraged the United States is that the government consider an executive order that in effect would create incentives where the federal government would say procure AI for certain uses only from companies who are self-certifying that they're implementing the NIST AI risk management framework. Let's ultimately find a way to combine standards with law and regulation. I'll give you an example that has spoken to me, something we take for granted every day. You get on a bus, it has an emergency brake. And when I have studied this, what's been interesting to me is the laws that require buses to have emergency brakes are typically implemented on a national or even at a municipal level. But they work because there has been a common standard created for emergency brakes for buses. We're going to need the same type of thing, a standard for, think of it as the safety brakes for AI that might be used to manage the electrical grid. If you have a common standard, then local or national governments can create laws and rules that build upon it. So the two things really go together in tandem. Well, um, somebody compared uh, AI like being on, uh, you know, Apollo 11 and on our way out to space. And it's hugely exciting, but also a uh, tiny bit scary. Uh, it's for sure been a real honor to have you here, Brad. And also a big thanks to uh, Ulis Fadrup, who's, uh, who's helped out and uh all the best of luck going forward, and uh, good luck. Well, thank you. It's probably a perfect note to end upon because we should remember that with Apollo 11, the goal was not just to send a man to the moon. It was to bring him back safely to Earth. We need to keep that same balance in mind as we look to the future of AI. Absolutely. Good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you.